The hearing will come to order. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fourth of our fiscal year 2022 hearings for the Transportation HUD subcommittee. Uh, as this hearing is fully virtual, we have to address a few housekeeping matters. For today's meeting, the chair or staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they're not recorded. under recognition for the purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. If I notice that you've not unmuted yourself, I'll ask you if you would like the staff to unmute you. If you indicate approval by nodding, staff will unmute your microphone. I remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock uh, still applies. If there's a technology issue, we'll move to the next member until the issue is resolved, and then you'll retain the balance of your time. Uh, you'll notice a clock on your screen that will show how much time's remaining. At uh, one minute remaining, the clock will turn to yellow. At 30 seconds remaining, I will gently tap the gavel to remind members their time has almost expired. When your time has expired, the clock will turn red. I'm uh, not going to interrupt your sentence, but I will move to uh, recognize the, uh, the next member. In terms of speaking order, we'll begin with the chair and ranking member. Then members will be recognized in order of seniority alternating sides. Uh, finally, House uh, rules require me to remind you that we've set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to. Uh, anything they wish to submit in writing at any of our hearings or markups. That email address has been provided in advance uh, to your staff. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to our fourth subcommittee hearing of this appropriations season. Today, we'll examine aviation safety and how the Federal Aviation Administration can strengthen its oversight of our national airspace uh, system. I'm pleased to welcome today's witness, FAA Administrator Steve Dixon. Administrator Dixon, thank you so much for being here today to testify answer our questions. Um, while we're hosting this meeting and, uh, of course, an, an altered format, I do expect the conversation to be um, inclusive and constructive and fruitful, uh, just as uh, productive as the hearing we held with you uh, last year. As a reminder to all the members here today, please mute your mic when you're not speaking and uh, ensure that your video uh, remains on so that we can confirm your presence. As many of you know, over the last few years, this subcommittee has placed particular emphasis on safety, equity, and resiliency, policy threads tracing through everything we do in the transportation and the housing departments. I know that those policy threads are also important to the FAA and to the entire Department of Transportation. In particular, the topic of safety will guide a large part of the dialogue today. When we began this conversation with the FAA in 2019, it was at a tragic time. It was in response to uh, the devastating Boeing MAX accidents, which took the lives of 346 passengers and crew members. All 346 of them have made an indelible imprint on me and I'm sure on every one of you. We do our work with the victims and their families at the forefront of our minds. We all know that uh, safety is not optional. It's not just a commodity. It's not just nice to have. Safety has to be required of every product, process, and person in the national airspace system as a matter of practice. Safety cannot be for sale or reserved for the highest bidder. The FAA needs to ensure that safety is measured and achieved in the way our aircraft are built, the way they're tested, the way they're maintained, the way our airports are designed, the way our air traffic control system is managed without providing a commercial advantage to anyone, <clears throat> manufacturer or operator or technology or airport. It is for everyone's benefit in the air and on the ground. We were recently reminded of, of this with the twin Pratt & Whitney engine fires later this week, uh, reminded us in rather vivid terms. Aviation safety requires cooperation among operators, manufacturers, pilots, airports, passengers, and civil aviation authorities uh, across the globe. Every advancement made in aircraft design or automation, in air traffic control, airport control, piloting, all of that strengthens our safety net. We can't use a piecemeal approach to safety. We need every component to operate with the same level of sophistication for the whole of aviation safety to be greater than the sum of its parts. After a century of commercial flight, all the proverbial low-hanging fruit uh, has been picked. I think it's uh, 
safe to say. What remains are the hardest problems, the most expensive, the most complicated, the most intricate problems at the tail ends of the distribution curve. As I alluded to earlier, eliminating those risks doesn't rest solely with the FAA. But if the FAA is to assert itself as a global leader in aviation safety, it does need to demonstrate that it um, uh, warrants that, um, that leadership concretely, repeatedly, proactively. Now, the aviation industry is changing rapidly. The FAA needs to keep pace without lowering its standards or relinquishing its authority. In other words, the tail can't wag the dog. The FAA needs to raise the expectations, guide the direction of its workforce, its counterparts, and the industry. When it comes to safety, there could be nothing short of relentless attention to every aspect of aviation operations. The FAA and its dedicated employees have an exceptionally challenging mission, one that's vital to our safety and economic well-being and global competitiveness. You provide critical services on behalf of the traveling public every day. Millions of flights must safely navigate our national airspace, which is uh, the most complex in the world. This subcommittee has worked to increase funding for the FAA over the past several years, dedicated in part to improve safety activities and the required personnel. We want to help the FAA modernize its air traffic control system, improve efficiency, transition legacy equipment into new platforms, and develop a highly skilled workforce. We won't be getting into the details of the fiscal 2022 budget today, but the administration, um, fortunately, has sing signal support for covering the growing costs of managing our national airspace and improving aviation safety, updating data analytics and decision-making, and modernizing air traffic. All of that is evident from the so-called skinny budget uh, document. I look forward to working with the agency and the administration and colleagues in Congress as we consider the fiscal 22 appropriations bill, the American Jobs Plan, and any other infrastructure opportunities uh, before us. I think it's safe to say, Mr. Administrator, that everybody here wants your agency to be an unqualified success. We want to give the FAA both the resources and the authority it needs to uh, carry out its mission. In turn, we need for the FAA to be candid with us, responsive to our questions about what they're doing, how they're doing it, why they're doing it, and how much it costs. Those questions are especially relevant to the FAA's 12-year endeavor to achieve greater safety and efficiency by modernizing its technology and procedures through NextGen and other initiatives. We appreciate the FAA's careful planning and gradual deployment of new capabilities to date. Everyone's eager for more. President's full fiscal 22 budget uh, is anticipated, widely anticipated, to give a comprehensive accounting of the FAA's plans, and we look forward to working with you on uh, that budget. Finally, I want to recognize that the FAA and its employees have not been spared for the challenges of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Your agency has, uh, has had to keep our nation's airspace functioning during a very uh, challenging year. I appreciate the work you've done to help get COVID-19 relief funding to airports while weathering uh, your own challenges. I know we'd all be interested to hear if there are any lessons learned from the pandemic about agency operations that you want to share with us uh, going forward. So again, thank you so much for being here today. I look forward to uh, the exchange with our, our full subcommittee. Now, I'm pleased to recognize my friend and the ranking member, Mario diaz Villart, for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I greatly appreciate working with you as we've worked hand-in-hand uh, hand for, again, a number of years now, and thanks for holding this important hearing. Um, Mr. Chairman, something that is not a, a reflection on you, a statement on you, but, but I, I hope that we can start having in-person hearings, especially since members of Congress uh, got early access to the vaccine. I think we owe it to our constituents, the American people, that uh, we, we start uh, normalizing and that uh, clearly this process is a lot more effective when we can do so in person. So with that, however, let me uh, let me welcome back uh, Administrator Dixon. Uh, it's your second appearance before the subcommittee. Uh, last appearance was uh, in March 2020. It's been quite a year uh, from uh, since then to now. Uh, thank you, Administrator, for your leadership as you have led a dedicated, dedicated workforce uh, throughout a series of challenges. 
you know, whether it's from the safety review and ungrounding uh, of the uh, Boeing 737 MAX to ensuring the safety of your workforce through the pandemic, as was stated by the chairman. We all greatly appreciate that uh, air traffic controllers, engineers, and technical workforce have been really frontline essential workers throughout this pandemic, and uh, all of us thank them for their valuable service. Uh, I expect, uh, Administrator, that your experience as an Air Force fighter pilot, a commercial pilot, and an airline executive has served you well as you've led the FAA with a steady hand, uh, a very steady hand through these challenges. I would also like to thank you for your absolute constant open communication with me since you were sworn in as administrator in 2019. I'm grateful for that, Mr. Administrator. I would note that um, we don't yet have your budget request for fiscal year 2022. Once we do receive your request, request uh, we will, as usual, do a line-by-line -line review of, of that request. Um, there is no daylight between the chairman and me on the need to provide you with the resources that you need to do your job to keep the traveling public safe. We also have a duty, a duty to the taxpaying public. Uh, we must ensure that every single dollar that we provide to the FAA helps you meet your mission. And I know that you share that view, Administrator. I would ask that you and your staff work with us on any questions that we might have once uh, your request is in. Now, as we work to determine FAA funding levels for FY 2022, I expect that we will continue to be mostly guided by a single question a very essential single question, which is what do we need to do? What do we need to do to maintain FAA's position as the world leader in aviation safety? I am proud of the work that this committee has done over the years to support that goal. FYI 2021 was no exception. We provided $18 billion to support the workforce, advance air traffic modernization, and advance innovative technologies like unmanned aircraft systems and, and commercial uh, spacecraft. We also provided resources to meet the challenge of safety certification, including the, the uh, Boeing MAX review and reforms to your, your organization delegation authorities, otherwise known as ODA. I know that you share with us the belief that there's no room for error when it comes to certification and safety oversight. So I look forward to hearing about your efforts in this area today. We're entering a, a new era, exciting era, in aviation with air transportation possibilities that sometimes seem, frankly, beyond our imagination. I want to ensure that the U.S. not only leads the world in safety standards, uh, but also leads the world in, in designing and manufacturing aircraft of the future and innovation. These aircraft will be cleaner, quieter, and more convenient for the public. We want to make sure that you have the resources and the authorities you need to make this new frontier a reality here in the United States. Administrator Dixon, again, thank you for your service to our country, your continuing service for our country, and I look forward to your testimony. Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield back. Uh, thank you. And uh, Administrator, we're now ready for your, uh, your statement. We, uh, again, appreciate your presence today. Your dedication to uh, aviation safety. You're now recognized for, for five minutes for your opening statement. And of course, your full written testimony will be included uh, for the record. Mr. Administrator. Good morning, uh, Chair Price, uh, Chair DeLauro, and uh, Ranking Member Diaz Bart, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for having me this morning. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to meet today to discuss the FAA's approach to aviation safety and to provide you with an update on our efforts to strengthen the aircraft certification process. First, however, I would like to acknowledge the families of the victims of the Lion Air and Ethiopian Airlines uh, accidents, in particular those who are joining us today. On behalf of the more than 45,000 employees of the FAA, I extend once again our deepest uh, condolences. The FAA's dedicated and professional workforce made a commitment to honor your loved ones by taking action to improve the margin of aviation safety around the globe. We have never wavered from that commitment, even in the midst of a global pandemic. Now, we've under, undertaken unprecedented steps over the past two years to investigate and understand these accidents and to apply what we've learned to strengthen aircraft certification and aviation safety overall. 
But we've taken a leadership role globally in these efforts and will continue to work with our counterparts around the world to raise the bar not only within the certification area, but also in the areas of flight operations, maintenance, human factors, and pilot training and qualification. And when I last uh, spoke to this committee uh, a little over a year ago, I pledged that the agency would take actions that make tangible and lasting improvements to the global aviation system as a result of these accidents, and that we would incorporate the input from the many reviews that had been conducted. We continue to honor that pledge, and we're making rapid progress. Now for the 737 MAX, I rescinded the grounding order in November of 2020, after 20 months of rigorous, methodical, and transparent safety analysis and reviews to address the issues that played a role in the two accidents. And as I've said previously, this process included an unprecedented intragovernmental and multinational effort to conduct a comprehensive assessment of the certification of the automated flight control system on the airplane. Now the entire process was transparent and conducted in full view of Congress, the industry, the public and the international aviation community. We were not driven by a schedule, only by our commitment to ensure that the aircraft was safe and fully ready to return to service. As you know, I myself went through the updated pilot training requirements and flew the aircraft before putting my signature on the order. Most of our foreign counterparts have now validated the aircraft as safe to fly in their respective countries. Now, going forward, the FAA is absolutely committed to ensuring that the conditions that contributed to the 737 MAX accidents never happen again in any context. Along with specific corrective actions related to the MAX, we're also spearheading broader changes throughout the global industry to increase the margin of safety. And two areas of particular focus are safety management systems and human factors considerations, both of which are key elements of the Aircraft Certification, Safety and Accountability Act that Congress passed in, in December. The Act has more than 100 unique requirements. Now regarding safety management systems, we've initiated rulemaking that contemplates requiring aircraft manufacturers that hold both a type certificate and a production certificate to adopt SMS cons consistent with international standards and practices. As part of this effort, we'll also consider safety management systems requirements for repair stations, charter operators, and certain air tour operators. This initiative also supports FAA's efforts to establish a just culture throughout the aviation sec uh, sector, as well as a risk management ide ideology for everyone involved in aerospace. As this rulemaking proceeds, we're working closely with industry to, to encourage early voluntary adoption. We currently have four design and manufacturing organizations that have voluntarily adopted an FAA accepted safety management system with nine others in progress. Now in the area of human factors upgrades, we've initiated a rulemaking to consider standardized regulations and guidance for conducting system safety assessments on transport category airplanes. And we've launched an expert safety panel to review legacy assumptions for technical areas, such as pilot response times when it comes to aircraft certification. As required by the act, we're also changing the way that we oversee ODA in addition to launching an expert panel that will review ODAs for transport airplanes, we'll be issuing revised policies that protect individual ODA unit members from undue pressure from their employers. As you know, we previously established an ODA office as required under the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018. Chair Price, I wanna assure you and each member of the subcommittee that we are fully committed to implementing the requirements under the act as quickly as possible, and we're making substantial progress in doing so. And again, thank you for your support uh, and your assistance and your leadership on aviation safety. Now I'll be happy to take your questions. Uh, thank you, Administrator. We, we will uh, begin our uh, questions, and I'll ask you one to start about the, um, the ungrounding of the MAX and the circumstances of that decision implications going forward. As, as you well know, the Boeing MAX grounding was the longest of any aircraft in uh, commercial aviation history. 
The FAA was the last civil aviation, civil aviation authority um, to ground the aircraft and the first to unground it. Uh, some civil aviation authorities, including those in Canada and Europe, um, issued their own ungrounding orders uh, shortly after the FAA did. But others, including authorities in China, Russia, Indonesia, have yet to underground the MAX. Uh, skeptics of your process, of the FAA certification process, and skeptics of the um, industry's uh, response to the MAX accidents um, would have preferred uh, a permanent grounding, probably. Uh, further fueling their doubts, the MAX has made several emergency landings uh, since then and has had ongoing electrical problems um, since the ungrounding. So let me ask you uh, a few uh, related questions. How, how have the FAA and other civil aviation authorities been tracking the return to service of the MAX fleet? Are you sharing information with each other and what, uh, what does the data tell you so far? Uh, does extra attention to the MAX fleet um, come at the expense of monitoring other air traffic uh, operations? And why are some um, civil av aviation authorities worldwide continuing to ground the MAX? What does the lack of a universal ungrounding tell us? I, I realize it probably tells us that there are multiple uh, considerations um, uh, that, that go into these decisions, and uh, we need to understand, though, what, uh, what, what those complexities are and um, what, uh, what, is, what is behind the, uh, the lack of unanimity among um, worldwide aviation authorities on, on this matter. Well, thank you for the question, uh, uh, Chair Price. And uh, first of all, I would say I have absolute confidence uh, in the safety of this airplane. Um, one of the things that uh, is very important as we monitor its performance is the fact that the airplanes had been grounded for so long and uh, airplanes like any machine don't like to be uh, not, not working over a period of time. So uh, I've spoken with the operators, with the manufacturers and we have tracked the uh, performance data and we are going above and beyond our normal continued operational safety process. We have daily meetings uh, with Boeing and regular uh, meetings with, uh, with the operators to assess the performance of all the systems uh, on the aircraft. And uh, it is performing as well or better overall uh, than any other uh, airplane out there in the aviation system right now. Uh, as you mentioned, we are working through the electrical grounding issue uh, at this point and looking at both the, the root cause of how that change was, was introduced into the manufacturing process and looking, making sure that we uh, run down uh, whether there were any other implications, uh, but we, it looks like a pretty straightforward uh, fix and we'll be working with Boeing uh, and the operators on what that looks like going forward. In terms of the, uh, uh, the international aviation community, civil aviation authorities around the world, uh, as you know, were involved in the uh, reviews and the certification management team the states of design, specifically uh, those who uh, design and are responsible for certifying large transport category aircraft, in particular EASA, Transport Canada, and Brazil, were in lockstep uh, throughout this process. And uh, for the most part, the airplane has been ungrounded and is successfully operating uh, around the world. And uh, we continue, we will continue to see uh, that uh, evolve as we go on into the future. And we'll continue to have dialogue both uh, bilaterally and regionally to uh, provide whatever support we need uh, for aviation authorities as they make those decisions uh, for their uh, for their airspace and for their countries. Uh, I, I ask uh, about the possible opportunity costs of the attention you're paying to the ungrounding, and, and this obviously is a, a demanding uh, uh, case, one that you need to stay on. Are there are there um, are there any costs to the agency in terms of uh, your other functions uh, regarding uh, the time and effort and manpower and woman power you're devoting to this? It's a good question, and uh, no, we are we are maintaining uh, uh, an equal level of diligence on all of the fleets that we're monitoring and all of the operators. And this is the good news about safety management systems: is that the the data sources that we have uh, within the operators. Uh, we'll continue to feed our systems as they do normally. 
So our oversight uh, and the, as issues come up uh, with various operators, those have been uh, unchanged. But we certainly uh, have an additional uh, level of, of diligence with respect to the 737 MAX, uh, again, in part because of the length of time that the airplane was grounded, in addition to the fact that, uh, you know, it's a, uh, uh, a process that we just want to make sure we're paying, paying very close attention to, along with all other aspects of commercial aviation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Gesblar. Thank you very, uh, very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let, let me kind of stick on the same, uh, same vein of questions that the chairman was asking. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, ODA, the Organized uh, Delegation Authority. Uh, obviously, so much has occurred, uh, taking place over the past several months on your certification program that I think it might make sense to take a kind of step back and look at the big picture. If you can tell us basically what is the different, what's different today? Uh, as compared to several years ago when the um, uh, the MAX was being certified. And for example, maybe a few spe specific examples would help us understand what progress you've made um, and also what remains to be done to make sure that we have, again, the safest system possible. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Ranking Member diaz Bard. It's a great uh, question and I appreciate the opportunity to address what's different today and what we're working on. Uh, and, it's, and it's much broader than ODA. I'll, I can speak more to ODA uh, in, a, in a subsequent uh, uh, line of questioning here. But at first, the first thing I want to emphasize is that these accidents should not have happened. And as everyone knows, there have been a number of reviews and recommendations conducted over the last two year uh, period, as well as the uh, cert reform legislation. Uh, that addresses the uh, contributing factors uh, to these accidents. And we are implementing those recommendations and those process improvements while we apply the lessons learned uh, over the last couple of years into our certification and safety oversight programs. So in, in the near term, you know, in terms of what's different with the process now, the first thing that we're doing is uh, with all of our major certification projects, we're using a technical advisory board. And these are subject matter experts uh, from other, uh, other uh, certification work who are very familiar with the processes and how, how they work, but they're not involved with that particular uh, process. And in some cases, this will evolve, involve a subject matter experts at the FAA, uh, but also uh, other parts of the government, such as the Department of Defense and NASA. Uh, additionally, we have hired, uh, thanks to the support of this committee, we have hired additional safety experts. One of the emphasis areas is in human factors to make sure that we are looking at in an integrated fashion at how the human interfaces with the, uh, the systems on the airplane. We've also implemented a new voluntary safety reporting program. And this is to address the reporting uh, issues, make sure that we have an open line of communication between our employees and, and the decision makers uh, up and down the entire organization at the FAA. It, it was uh, implemented on April 5th uh, after a lot of work and partnership uh, with our union partners. And uh, it's very similar to what we have in terms of voluntary uh, anonymous programs with our air traffic controllers and our technicians that work in our air traffic organization and also uh, emulates the highly successful voluntary safety reporting programs at the air carriers. We're also conducting uh, inter integrated project team uh, interactions uh, meetings on a regular basis. And this brings together uh, really the FA from an enterprise approach so that we're not looking at issues piecemeal. We're making sure that operational considerations are taken into account throughout the design process. And then we, we're also uh, increasing the retention of some of the functions that we had delegated uh, previously in terms and key critical areas such as system safety assessments and uh, airworthiness certificates. Now, longer term, uh, as I mentioned in my opening statement, we are conducting rulemaking on safety management systems uh, for manufacturers where we have uh, done a lot of work to improve our workforce forecasting in terms of the kind of skill sets uh, that we need in the agency now and on into the future to make sure that we stay ahead of all the developing trends. 
and we're, uh, we've got a big emphasis on safety data. Uh, Chair Price mentioned this, and uh, the, the, the higher fidelity data and the more integrated look that we have in terms of safety data will allow us to be much more proactive and even predictive about uh, mitigating safety risk. And that will allow us uh, on in, now and into the future uh, the opportunity to get to, uh, better visibility into safety issues, not only within the U.S., but around the world. Great, a very thorough answer. I appreciate that, uh, Director. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Administrator, for being here. Um, I've been here 12 years. In those 12 years, it, it's been apparent that the, the, the noise standard that we've used dealing with aviation noise is insufficient. And probably for those 12 years, I've been asking FAA to do an analysis, a study to reassess this uh, to absolutely zero satisfaction. Uh, but as you know, fast forward to the present, FAA released the long-awaited Neighborhood Environmental Survey earlier this year, and the results were uh, shocking. Uh, for decades, the FAA has held that the noise measurement of 65 DNL is only highly annoying, a technical term, to roughly 10% of the individuals exposed to it. Uh, these recent results of this neighborhood study indicated 50% of the individuals exposed to noise levels at or above 65 find it highly annoying. Uh, undoubtedly, this level of noise severely impacted resident respondents to the survey, raising questions as whether this is an acceptable level. Uh, if a noise level of 65 DNL may be negatively affecting five times more individuals than previously assumed. Do you think that merits that we finally get around to determining whether the 65 DNL standard accurately reflects the impact of aviation noise? Well, thank you for the question, uh, Congressman Quigley. And I agree with you that uh, the, the results of the noise survey are something, they are very important to us and uh, they will uh, inform uh, our decisions going forward. And um, as a result of the work that we have done over the past number of years, you mentioned some of it. Uh, you know, we have seen a lot of progress in over the last you know 20 to 25 years in terms of addressing noise at the source, uh, quieter aircraft, uh, more efficient flight paths, uh, et cetera. And overall, there are there are uh, fewer uh, people in our communities who are affected by noise, but that has not translated into what we hear uh, from communities, uh, as you said. So we've got to figure out uh, what the right what the right balance is from a public policy perspective. And so uh, what we are doing is we are initiating, and we announced this uh, a few weeks ago. We are initiating a comprehensive policy review of how uh, how the agency manages uh, aviation noise and uh, we are engaging the federal mediation and conciliation service in doing this because i want to make sure that this is not an internal faa process or even internal within the government that we engage all stakeholders uh, we've got to engage the airlines airports uh, communities uh, to make sure that we make the right policy choices going forward the threshold issue that we will, that we need to look at is whether DNL is the appropriate metric, and then, as you said, uh, the uh, also whether the 65 uh, DNL threshold uh, makes sense. And then beyond that, there are supplemental metrics that may in, uh, that may be useful. Um, you're familiar with some of them, and some of them are being used in other parts of the world to make sure that we've got uh, a good comprehensive uh, solution with how we're going to uh, to manage aviation noise in the context of all of the broader uh, trade-offs that need to be made in terms of uh, environment emissions and other aspects of, of the aviation system. And, and excuse me, Administrator, you just have to excuse you, the sins of the fathers, right? This has been something we've been working on a long time and you inherited some of something of the mess. I mean, whatever happened to the original 65 DNL study, we had heard through the grapevine that it had been, for lack of a better expression, screwed up. But consider all that interest and effort. And what we got was one paragraph 
in the FAA Reauthorization Act that demanded this, we got one paragraph in there uh, in the FAA's report to Congress released in April 2020. Um, are they going to release what they analyzed with 65 DML noise study, or are they going to start over? We will be uh, undertaking the 65 DNL uh, as part of the comprehensive policy analysis. Uh, so that what we have done up to this point is look at alternative metrics uh, to 65. And, uh, and, and so we will again undertake that as part of this overall policy review. And it, again, it will not be just FAA, it will be uh, the entire uh, aviation community and those who are affected by aviation noise. It just because inquiring minds want to know, at some point, could someone tell us what happened to the last noise study that was to analyze 65 DNL? Well, I'll be happy to follow up with uh, with you and your staff uh, uh, directly, uh, Congressman. Thank you. Um, the uh, next, I'm going to recognize Mr. Womack. In the meantime, uh, we're getting a good bit of uh, noise from uh, somebody's. Uh, if everyone will mute themselves when they're not speaking, I think that'll help us. Uh, Mr. Womack. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate uh, the, the opportunity to speak with the FAA Administrator. Administrator Dixon, good to see you again. Let me, let me again uh, thank you for the time you spent with uh, myself and Senator Cotton uh, on uh, some airspace issues in Arkansas. And we hope, uh, fingers crossed, we hope that uh, we're re-engaging with the FAA on that very issue here in the next month or two and, and uh, look forward to having uh, those continued discussions. And I know this is an aviation safety oversight hearing, but I want to remind uh, my colleagues here that we're still waiting on the spending uh, plan. Uh, it'd be kind of nice uh, to have a hearing like this and, and have the spending plan in front of the FAA administrator. We're, we're, uh, as I said, we're still waiting on it. Um, you make up about 20% of what this uh, subcommittee spends in, in the discretionary uh, fashion. And, uh, and I think it's important to kind of have an idea of, of where we're headed. I want to ask about the Aircraft Certification Safety and Accountability Act. Uh, in it, Administrator Dixon, there's a $27 million uh, authority for recruiting engineers, safety personnel, experts, technical advisors, uh, and so on. So my first question is, is, is that $27 million enough? Is it just about right? Uh, is it more than enough? Uh, help me understand. Uh, I know it's a small amount, uh, but uh, as it concerns its purpose, uh, what can you tell us? Well, thank you for the question, Congressman Womack, and I appreciate your uh, your support and, the, and again the committee's support for these uh, these resources. Uh, you know, we we have uh, we are well resourced now, and uh, we are hiring. Uh, subject matter experts and safety experts in the areas of uh, software uh, engineering and uh, human factors, uh, system safety analysis, and systems engineers. And uh, we'll be bringing uh, 75 uh, folks on board uh, this year. We will have continuing needs uh, going forward. We expect for the certification universe and our responsibilities as we get into uh, more predictive types of data analytics, for example, and take an enterprise uh, approach to those issues. Uh, we will certainly have uh, more needs going forward, and it's it's very important that that we continue to have that dialogue. So I would say that we're, uh, in answer to your question, we're well positioned at this point, but it is going to have to be a continuing uh, dialogue because the aviation system, if anything, is getting uh, more dynamic and more diverse, uh, as you know. Are you going to need special hiring authorities in any of these uh, positions? Uh, we, as you, well, again, we have uh, some special authorities uh, at this point uh, that have served us well, but it is, uh, you know, and we have engaged uh, again with our uh, labor partners uh, to look at our outreach, our recruiting, uh, how we retain uh, individuals. And it's something that we'll need to continue to have uh, dialogue on. But I, again, I think we're well positioned at this point. We've got to look at, in, in some ways, we're in competition with the private sector, but in other ways, uh, you know, the the uh, the opportunity to work uh, within the uh, within the FAA is very attractive, and we don't necessarily need exactly the same skills for uh, for oversight. 
so it's something that we'll have to continue to to work on with you and we look forward to partnering with you on that. Okay, uh, in my last 90 seconds, I wanna talk about contract towers just a minute. Uh, like many of my colleagues, you know, I got four airports in my district that are in the contract tower program. Uh, my understanding is it handles uh, close to 30% of, of traffic, uh, but about 10% of your overall tower budget. Uh, so can you discuss the importance of the contract tower program and how FAA plans to ensure the program's continued success? Yeah, so the contract tower program is very important to us. Uh, it provides a margin of safety uh, at, at airports uh, where we don't have a federal tower and the, uh, the, the level of, of operations might not always uh, support a federal tower. So this is, uh, this is something that's very important to us. We know it's important to the airports and important to the communities. Uh, the, uh, the way that the towers are, are, are implemented, obviously the COVID-19 pandemic has reduced air, um, air traffic operations in many areas. And so we have essentially gone back and we have resnapped our baseline to make sure that there is, uh, that we minimize or eliminate any impact from reduced traffic uh, just from COVID so we can continue to support and build uh, upon the contract tower program. Thanks again for your time, sir. I'm gonna yield back, Chairman Price. Uh, thank you, we'll now turn to uh, Ms. Clark. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and welcome, Administrator Dixon. I wanna start by associating myself uh, with the comments of uh, Congressman Quigley, but I also want to thank you for your recent decision to implement this committee's directive in the uh, FY21 T-HUD appropriations to treat certain residents with faulty noise insulation as unmitigated and therefore eligible for the new noise abatements. I know these issues are complex. They mean a great deal to many of our constituents and I appreciate your willingness to help these homeowners. Thank you so much for that. Um, I want to go back to uh, the Boeing Max crash. Uh, and at the time, uh, it was brought to my attention that there are a variety of federal aviation safety incident reporting systems. These databases are meant to be predictive tools, but they are dispersed over at least three separate agencies. And because they can contain proprietary information, some of them are not updated regularly. For example, this morning, the FAA's accident and incident data system had a freeze date of December 31st. That's the most recent date of uploaded incidents. Even though of 2019, December 31st of 2019, even though the data was uploaded on April 2nd, so that's a 16 month delay. And when this issue was first brought to my attention back in 2019, the data delay was nine months and we were concerned about that. If this information is meant to have, uh, is necessary for critical and timely safety determinations, do you believe the current system is adequate? And if not, what are your recommendations to improve the incident surveillance system? Well, thank, thank you for the question. And, uh, and data uh, and the ability to be able to analyze uh, data and move towards predictive or proactive, certainly, but even predictive analysis is something that has been extremely important to me uh, from day one. And uh, I've seen the benefits uh, in, in the airline industry, and we need to bring that to all segments of, of the aviation system. With respect to the uh, accident and incident system that you're referring to, we are in the process of modernizing that system. And uh, those upgrades that are being uh, performed uh, can affect the dates that records are uploaded and made available to the public. But our safety analysts and decision makers do have access to the records as soon as they're entered into the system. And uh, there is still the uh, preliminary uh, accident and incident notification system that is available within 24 hours. So again, this is one system that we're, that we're upgrading among many. Uh, and it's important that we bring all of these together 
to, uh, to give us, again, higher fidelity data upon which to make uh, these safety decisions, and we will continue to do that. We appreciate the committee's support um, and investment in these efforts. Yeah, so if I understand your testimony correctly, you're saying that the FAA can see this data within 24 hours? Yes, we can see the, we can see the information uh, and, and, uh, and be able to act upon it. Uh, there is a time lag in which in how it's presented uh, in some areas, and and that's what we're, that's what we're working on now. Okay, and if, can you tell me why the freeze date has gone from nine months to sixteen months? Is that somehow part of your upgrading, or it's what? part it's part of the upgrade, is my understanding. But I would have to I'll have to follow up with you, uh, my staff follow up with you on the exact details of what the nuts and bolts of, uh, of that delay are. Okay, and a few seconds remaining. Um, in the Department of Justice deferred prosecution agreement with Boeing, they were not required to admit guilt or fraud, uh, guilt or fault for intentionally concealing information. I'd love if you could follow up with me if you think this is a sufficient deterrent to prevent companies from concealing essential safety information. Well, because concealing essential safety information is never acceptable. And I, you know, I'm not in a position to comment specifically on the deferred penalty. That That is a tool uh, that the Justice Department has in its, in its toolbox. Uh, I, I would say from the FAA's perspective, there is no substitute for rigorous oversight. And that is our mission and what I am committed to and what our safety professionals are committed to in the case of Boeing and all of those that we oversee within the aviation system. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rutherford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, uh, Administrator Dixon, for your, your testimony here today. And and to follow up on the uh, on the 737 Max issue, I'd like to ask a question about the the safety management systems that you that you mentioned with the aircraft manufacturers and operators and the certifying uh, and operators who are doing both. They was that not a part of development before uh, the 737 Max incidents? That's correct. Uh, safety management systems have existed for a number of years at the uh, major passenger airlines, and they have been a big contributor to the advances in aviation safety that we have seen really since the, the late 90s of a 94% uh, uh, improvement in, uh, in aviation safety. So uh, we want to, to expand that program. Uh, it involves uh, business processes. It really makes safety uh, the core business process uh, within the private sector and, uh, and also provides a mechanism again for things like voluntary reporting and, uh, and data sharing uh, with the regulator with appropriate protocols. So, uh, and, it, and it also is a big driver in a positive uh, safety culture. So, uh, you know, SMS, uh, throughout the aviation system, there is some upfront effort that's required to get those systems in place. But once they're in place, they have been very beneficial uh, in my experience and in the agency's yeah. experience. We intend to see that through going forward. Good. I, I, I appreciate that. Listen, speak, speaking about safety and, and looking ahead, you mentioned earlier anticipation of, of problems. The, the commercial uh, space industry, I want to ask you a question about that if I could. Uh, the FAA's Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee uh, recommended last fall that all future space transportation rulemaking utilize new authority given to the Secretary to create aerospace rulemaking committees uh, to promulgate those rules coming forward. Uh, can, can you tell me, uh, can you, will you be able to provide us an update on these committees and, and the uh, work that they do with the FAA in the commercial space industry? 
Sure. The, uh, we have actually we have an existing uh, federal advisory committee. The uh, the uh, Comstack is what it's called, and we meet with them on a regular basis uh, and uh, go over uh, industry uh, priorities and certainly uh, rulemaking activity. We just completed a uh, a rulemaking uh, activity over the last year that has been uh, several years in the making to streamline and uh, move to a more performance-based type of regulatory system for uh, launch and re-entry re licensing. And uh, we, uh, we are seeing record levels, as you've probably seen in the news, of commercial space activities. Uh, we are already uh, exceeding our, our, uh, our, our historical levels by uh, almost double uh, what we've seen in previous years. And we are, uh, we have reorganized and we continue to uh, 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 update business processes within our commercial space group to make sure that we can uh, oversee those operators and manufacturers that are coming into that space. So it's an exciting time, but, uh, but we need to stay ahead of it and, uh, and we are ready to step up. Thanks. But listen, uh, let me let me ask this question also. Uh, the the FAA has has stated that a major objective of the Beyond program uh, is to advance beyond visual line of sight operations for package delivery, uh, public safety and infrastructure inspection that the FAA FAA will require reporting from uh, government lead and industry partners. Can, can you talk a little bit about the Beyond program and where we're at with these, uh, you know, Beyond line of, uh, or Beyond visual line of sight uh, operators? Yes, yeah, so it's a great question. So the, the uh, our strategy for a number of years has been to uh, integrate uh, UAS drone operations into the airspace rather than segregate them only into specific areas as some others uh, around the world have, have decided to do. And uh, that we've got to ensure the, the safety of the aviation system. Uh, and what we've done up to this point is we've used our existing regulatory uh, construct to uh, enable operations, but they've pretty much been uh, for, for specific applications and we've used our waiver authority uh, on that. And uh, the, the previous pilot program that we had, the predecessor to Beyond, really showed what those business applications can be. Package delivery, uh, linear infrastructure inspection, a whole, host of, a whole host of things. So we are building on, on that work now. Now that we have the remote identification rule and the uh, uh, operations over people rules uh, uh, finished, now we can move on to more scalable uh, beyond visual line of sight. And that's what, the, that's what we're really after with beyond is to, again, take these specific applications and work to scale these operations more broadly around the national airspace system so that they can be done on a more routine basis going forward. That involves working with uh, the private sector stakeholders, but it also involves working with our security partners and addressing other issues uh, that are important to society uh, beyond strictly aviation safety. And so that's what Beyond will help us. Will help Thank us. you, Administrator. Ms. Watson Coleman. I'll be on back, Mr. Chair. Ms. Watson Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Mr. Administrator, for being here. Um, I, I want to follow up on a safety question, uh, particularly with regard to the two Boeing uh, Maxes that. Um, resulted in those ter terrible accidents. Um, what lessons have we learned? I, I believe that there was some intentional withholding of information and preparation um, uh, for pilots to understand how to respond when there was a need to, to use this instrumentation. And this is somehow an intentional omission what is it that you all have learned from that? And what is it that the FAA is doing differently today in its oversight 
to try to catch that kind of uh, inf important information safety withholding? Well, thank you for the question. This is this is core to uh, to uh, one of our big focus areas, and that is the importance of of communication and coordination in exercising our oversight activities. And I spoke to this a bit earlier, but I'll, I'll provide some additional details. Uh, one of the things that safety management systems will do is it will allow, uh, uh, they will allow us to uh, maintain an arm's length relationship, but also uh, become, uh, have better visibility into the safety decisions uh, as they are being made. And so there will be opportunities uh, for uh, tighter coordination and to make sure that we have full visibility into, the, into uh, this across the, uh, the manufacturer um, uh, spectrum uh, as, we, as we do here. Um, additionally, these integrated project teams uh, that I spoke about are on the agency side are making sure that as information is passed to uh, one part of the agency that we are taking an enterprise look and understanding the, the uh, human factors implications and what information is being av made available to flight crews. Uh, you know, this information about MCAS should have been uh, okay. in the operating manual and should have been in the systems manual of the airplane. And that's one of the, one of the core things that we need to right. continue to focus on going forward. I, I guess that's what I don't completely understand how you catch that how you catch the withholding of something of that nature what is it what is it that we're doing differently now that would um send up a red flag that something is missing or that we need to look more closely and, and hold the company more accountable these uh these pro these uh dynamic project reviews uh, that i spoke about make sure that that everyone is on the same page uh, and then also, there's been a lot of work done even now on voluntary safety management systems. There's been a lot of progress made at Boeing in particular over the past year on that. And, uh, and those processes will surface the, this type of information in a more consistent way. And again, this will continue to be a very primary focus for us. Do you think that you'll have to rely upon an anonymous um, reporting to you as well? Well, absolutely, and that's where the voluntary safety yeah. program comes in, and also where Just Culture comes in. And it, it needs to be not only put in place, but it needs to be nurtured and supported by leadership, both at the agency and uh, within the private sector. And that is absolutely a, a very high priority for us. Thank you. Um, I wanted to talk to you about uh, your recruitment and retention of um, certain um, um, uh, jobs, in your agency, and I know that you have a robust recruitment effort going. I'm wondering, do you have any of your recruitment uh, targeting HBCUs and other minority capabilities? And if so, have you been successful? You said you're gonna bring in 75 new uh, employees. Do you have any kind of expectations of diversity with regard to race, ethnicity, as well as uh, women? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. And this is, a, a, again, another uh, focus area for us. Uh, and we have several things that we do, both near term and long term, certainly uh, diversity and making sure that we cast the widest possible net and that we bring in the, the uh, uh, you know, young people, frankly, into the agency that have the kind of skills uh, that we need uh, going forward. This is an exciting time in aerospace and aviation and at the agency there's a lot of a lot of uh interesting things even beyond legacy aviation that we are involved in we talked about drones and commercial space so this really has widened the aperture for us uh, i've been personally engaged in many of these efforts we work with um, several uh, groups uh, we work with the hbcus uh, we also have a minority serving institutions intern program which we almost doubled uh, this year, and uh, they have been involved in several important projects around the agency, and we are hopeful that they will uh, 
they will uh, uh, gain benefit from that work and that they will be future FAA employees. Uh, we also have two uh, advisory committees that are working with us to help identify barriers for women in uh, an, an underrepresented group. And uh, our uh, uh, Women in Aviation Advisory Committee uh, and our Youth and Aviation Advisory Committee, and we expect to hear from them, and that will give us uh, additional opportunities that we can work on together going forward. Thank you, Mr. Administrator. I look forward to uh, having follow-up discussions about how successful these efforts are. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you, Ms. Henson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, good morning, Administrator Dixon. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, I just wanted to also extend a thank you to, uh, to you specifically for making your central regional um, administrator available to speak with me a little earlier, earlier this year. Um, we worked together. We were able to resolve an issue we were having at the Eastern Iowa Airport in my district. So um, look forward to continuing to work with you there to um, serve Iowans. Um, one of the topics that I talked about on my call with the agency was the need to ensure that the FAA is giving as much um, attention to, to rural Americans like the islands I represent as it is to those who live in um, major coastal areas with those big international airports. Um, airports like the Eastern Iowa Airport in Cedar Rapids and the Dubuque Airport um, are critical ports of entry um, and exit for my constituents and for businesses too. So um, as we're looking at smaller regional airports like um, Independence in the municipal airport there, they're also absolutely critical for our local and uh, regional economies in my district as well. So um, can you just to that end kind of give me your thoughts on what the agency is doing to ensure um, the AIP, the Airport Improvement Pro uh, Program, which is very popular, grant opportunities for a lot of airports, um, but I just wanna make sure um, we're on the same wavelength in terms of making it equally available to uh, the smaller rural airports um, as it is to the larger uh, metropolitan and international airports. So can you just expand on what your agency is doing there? Thank you, Congresswoman. I couldn't agree with you more that uh, uh, smaller and rural airports play an absolutely critical role in our aviation system. I think the chairman mentioned that we have the most uh, dynamic and diverse uh, aviation system in the world. And a lot of it is because of, uh, of uh, the contributions uh, that these airports are making to our system. So our airports uh, regional offices work very closely uh, with airport sponsors to understand their, their needs and their uh, projects that they need to complete to make sure that the aviation infrastructure is, uh, is properly uh, maintained and improved. Uh, mm -hmm. going, we will continue to do that. And uh, there's always an opportunity to make sure that as applications for projects come forward, uh, that they get all due consideration along with those, as you state, at some of the, the larger uh, hub airports uh, for commercial aviation around the country. We'll continue to do that. Um, I would point out that there's always more demand than we have resources for AIP, and these projects do, uh, in many cases, require, uh, they are multi-year projects, so once projects are going you know, at one airport, we want to make sure that we can see them through. But in that text, we are, uh, we are uh, proud and very, extremely motivated uh, to work with uh, the airports in your district, and we will continue to do that. Oh, I appreciate that, Ad Administrator Dixon. And um, I had a call a few weeks ago with Secretary Buttigieg, uh, a really good call. We talked about um, you know, how the agency officials at DOT can more proactively work with um, some of those smaller uh, grant applicants because uh, they may not have, you know, the teams of professional grant writers that um, bigger cities have. Um, what steps would you say um, your employees or your agency is taking to work with um, uh, folks to maybe improve their applications? You, you talk about the demand obviously being greater than the resources, but um, sometimes, you know, it may be, mean a minor um, issue or an error on an application is the reason why they don't get those resources. So can you kind of expand on what you're doing there? Yeah, this is why the, why the engagement with our uh, regional uh, uh, or district airport offices are so important because if we have early engagement and really understand uh, the nature of a project, we can, we can help uh, guide that applicant uh, in the process to make sure that it's uh, properly documented and justified uh, so that it can uh, be brought forward. So we'll continue to do that. And I, just, I would just encourage early engagement if there are specific uh, 
uh, airports uh, that are, are of interest. You know, we are always open for business and, and uh, looking for those opportunities to have dialogue with the airport sponsors. I certainly appreciate that uh, open line of communication. And um, like I said, I, I'm grateful to you to, for working with us um, earlier this year. We were able to get those um, inspectors and those engineers out so our projects could move forward at, uh, at Cedar Rapids and at Dubuque. So much appreciate uh, that. And I'll have some additional questions if we have time for a second round. But in the meantime, um, thank you so much. And Mr. Chair, I yield back. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Torres. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Administrator. Uh, Dixon for being here. It's good to see you again. Um, if I may shake your memory again. Um, I was, um, the last time you were before our committee, I was very concerned um, about the lack of response to some of my constituents. So um, as you just stated, early engagement and uh, constant communication really goes a long way as we begin to um, continue to hear noise issues. Um, I also want to associate myself with uh, Chairman Quigley's uh, comments regarding alternative metrics um, to noise level 65. Uh, on a personal note, there's nothing um, more frightening, well, other than the insurrection, than to be shaken out of bed between 3 and 4 a.m. Uh, to have a, a plane over you. Um, don't live that close to, a, to the airport. So, you know, um, those issues are of constant concern in our community. Um, I understand that during COVID-19, um, airlines, airports, and the FAA have reported interfering with flight crews. And the FAA alone has received over a thousand complaints about passengers um, since February alone. And I recognize that this is not only a COVID problem, unruly passengers, particularly those who have been drinking, um, have been harassing crews and other passengers for years. Um, surveys have shown 70% of flight attendants have been sexually harassed at work which is absolutely unacceptable. And I know that you agree with that. Um, there are other safety issues besides harassment. I myself have been on flights where the passengers seated in the emergency exit rows have had so many drinks that if there was an emergency, it didn't look like they would be capable of opening the door or moving out of the way. So Administrator uh, Dixon, what um, can we here on the Hill do to support the FAA's effort to protect passengers and crews from unruly passengers and harassment? Um, and in light of the recommendations of the 2020 National In-Flight Sexual Misconduct Task Force, uh, do you have any plans to improve the ways FAA protects crews and passengers from uh, harassment? Well, thank you for the question, uh, Congresswoman Torres. And, uh, you know, the the task force itself is under the purview of the department, but we certainly are uh, very interested and focused on supporting our flight crews uh, uh, around the system from an aviation safety perspective. The workplace needs to be safe, uh, along with, uh, you know, the uh, safe conduct of of aircraft and passengers uh, in commercial aviation. So that will continue to be a focus uh, for us. As you know, uh, during the pandemic, uh, we have uh, done a lot of work uh, with the carriers, uh, with uh, labor both inside and outside the agency uh, to make sure that uh, protocols in terms of, of, uh, of public health and other requirements uh, were supported. And uh, as you noted, we have had uh, a big increase in the number of unruly passenger uh, uh, situations over the last few months. And that is why I initiated the Special Emphasis Enforcement Program, where we go directly uh, in these appropriate situations to uh, civil enforcement of up to uh, $35,000 civil penalty. We have announced a number of those recently. Uh, it does take some time to put the facts together uh, to make sure that these will stand up. Uh, but we, we are working very closely with the air carriers 
and again with labor to make sure that these are brought to light so that we get this uh, this under control. And it's a it's a big emphasis what is, on uh, what is EPA is doing specifically uh, to review the safety impact of excessive drinking on flights as it relates to passengers sitting on the exit row. Um, well, the flight crews are trained uh, in terms of uh, handling a passenger, and I've, I've encountered this myself in my career, who is uh, inebriated, attempting to get on an aircraft, and there are protocols in place for uh, behavior-based decision-making where the flight attendants and the captain and the gate agent will work together uh, to make sure that person cannot fly. But uh, also with respect to the exit row seating, which I think you're referring to, uh, there is additional interaction uh, between the flight attendants and those passengers uh, with uh, with dialogue that has to do with their ability to be able to perform those functions where they have an opportunity, an additional opportunity to evaluate whether the individual is capable of, of doing that. And so we, that's a continued emphasis item uh, in crew training, and we will continue to, uh, to uphold those standards going forward. And, I, uh, I yield back, but I look forward on the second round to continuing to expand on that question. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Administrator. Uh, I'd like to use my time to talk about drones, uh, talk about good drones and bad drones. And uh, I'll start with the bad drones. You know, my district's over 820 miles of Texas and Mexico border. As you know, you know, we have a, a crisis on our southern border. Um, what... There, there are reports that criminal organizations are using drones to transport contraband across our border. How is the FFA working with agencies like CBP and Air Marine Operations to test and implement aerial surveillance technologies that can detect illicit drone activities on our border? Well, thank you for the question. And yes, we do work very closely with uh... Uh, with uh, DHS, uh, CBP, DOD, and others who have uh, counter UAS authorities uh, to make sure that those authorities can be conducted safely and not interfere with uh, other types of aviation operations. And we'll continue to do that. Um, there are a number of tests underway and research underway right now uh, to test counter UAS in the airport environment, but this same kinds of principles apply in the in the border environment that we want to uh, enable the kinds of activities that will allow these uh, these counter UAS operations uh, to continue. But we've just got to make sure that uh, the rest of the aviation system is is protected as we do that. Is there anything in particular that you would need from this subcommittee in order to help uh, that process? Because I think it's so critical. You know, these UAVs uh, are, the, are the future of good and bad, and, and it really worries me the illicit activity that's happening. Is there anything you need from our end? Uh, I would say that we just need to stay, uh, continue to have dialogue as we do our uh, research. Uh, we're working again in the airport environment specifically uh, TSA has some has some uh, activity going on right now. We are in very close touch with them, and we'll continue to stay in close touch with our federal security partners uh, to make sure that they that their activities can be enabled, but that aviation safety can be maintained. And I think it's just really important as as capabilities progress uh, that we stay very close to make sure that we're adequ adequately resourced in those efforts. Right. Thank you. Uh, my next question, as uh, technology for drones becomes more sophisticated, so does the opportunity for bad actors to use them for malicious activities. DHS has recognized this threat and launched an effort to work with federal partners like FFA to detect and diminish risks posed by unauthorized drones. One of the areas where this kind of work is being completed is, is at our nation's airports. The FFA recently selected five test airports to conduct research on confronting unauthorized drones that approach safe airspaces. Could you provide an overview of what this program entails and any updates on FFA's findings to date? Sure, uh, well, I, I alluded to this a little bit earlier. Uh, we, are, uh, we need to make sure that uh, counter UAS technology that's being uh, contemplated and utilized, that those capabilities do not interfere with 
uh, the safe operation of the airspace, in particular around airports. And uh, so uh, TSA is is evaluating uh, capabilities down at Miami right now, but separately looking at it from the aviation safety perspective, we have initiated uh, research activities looking at uh, 10 distinct counter UAS technologies, uh, and we will, we will we are in the process of selecting those now, and we will begin that testing at our technical center and the adjacent uh, airport uh, in Atlantic City. And then once we refine th that those capabilities, then we will uh, work with our security partners and with the airports to make sure that we have a comprehensive solution for uh, making sure that malicious uh, actors are not able to interfere with airport operations going forward. Uh, thank you for that. You know, I really feel this is uh, the future of aviation. You know, we're going to have these unmanned drones that are part that are going to be part of our economic system and. and when you bring that new sense of technology, it adds also a layer of nefarious activity to it. So I think uh, you know these test programs are great. Allows us to get ahead of it and think up and think uh, through kind of the future a little bit. Please let me know on my end anything I can do to be helpful. And with that, Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Escalade. Need to unmute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Administrator Dixon, for coming before us on these important issues. Uh, last Congress, I served on the Transportation uh, Infrastructure Committee, and very shortly after the second uh, 737 MAX crash, I was among the first in the community to uh, call for the planes grounding while we figured out exactly what went wrong. I know many of my colleagues have asked uh, about why it took so long for the FAA to act and multiple hearings were held after the incident. And since then, um, so I, I don't want to relit uh, relitigate this issue, but as a, a former member of the TNI uh, committee, I also participated in a markup for the Aircraft Certification Safety and Accountability Act and was pleased to see it, it got enacted at, at the end of last year. During this year, however, appropriations request uh, process, my office has received numerous outreach about providing resources for some of the new programs and activities established by that act. So I would like to hear from you um, how uh, implementation of the new law is going. Are there enough resources uh, you feel that are adequate to meet important goals of, of the bill to improve aviation safety and oversight? And do you feel the, there are funds being used in some areas that perhaps could be better used elsewhere? Well, thank you for the question and I, I appreciate your, uh, uh, your support, uh, Congressman. Uh, as I mentioned uh, uh, to one of the earlier, uh, in response to one of the earlier questions, uh, the, going forward, uh, it is really important that that we integrate all of our data systems and that we have uh, ability uh, into uh, issues uh, from an enterprise perspective and that we break down silos both within the agency um, and within uh, the private sector. Uh, and this is how we have been able to collaborate with industry over the last 20 years or so to really improve uh, the margin of aviation safety in the U.S. And there are opportunities to do that uh, around the world. Um, and we are definitely uh, in a position to play a leadership role there. We need to make sure that we maintain uh, robust uh, bilateral relationships and also work through ICAO uh, to make sure that aviation safety improvements are recognized and that the, that, uh, the uh, the regulators having visibility in real time, as much real time as we can, into what's happening uh, in daily operations is very important. Uh, the question was asked earlier about how we're monitoring the 737 MAX. This is one of the reasons why we're looking at space-based ADS-B. Uh, it has traditionally been thought of as a, uh, a way to uh, control traffic in areas where there's no ground-based infrastructure or air traffic surveillance. 
But is there a safety benefit that we can derive from having access to that information in more real time? So these are the kind of innovative uh, thoughts that we have on really integrating the information and, and, and bubbling it up and making it visible so that we can make uh, proactive uh, decisions going forward. We look forward to working with the committee and with you uh, to move that forward. Uh, real quickly, just to finalize on a local issue, I represent a district that probably has one of the heaviest air traffic in the country with LaGuardia, Newark, JFK, Westchester, and even a smaller airport, Teterboro. Are there any measures that are being taken there by the FAA to ensure greater uh, safety in this particular crowded air airspace? Yes, uh, so there, there, there's a quite a bit of uh, redevelopment activity happening at those airports. Uh, the redesign of LaGuardia is, uh, is important. We're also uh, looking at uh, new flight procedures uh, coming in and out of those airports that will be more efficient and will add a level of predictability uh, to the operation and take some of the variability out that we see during some of the arrival and departure banks and, and more effectively deconflict airspace. And that's a journey that we have been on that we will continue to uh, prioritize as we go forward. And finally, we're making sure that we are uh, adequately staffed and that our facilities are, are uh, uh, rehabilitated where they need to be and that we make the appropriate investments uh, in our physical infrastructure so that we can continue to support uh, robust aviation operations, particularly uh, in the areas that you described that are so important to our national airspace. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, uh, Ms. Paxton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Administrator Dixon, for joining us here today. Now, I represent a district in Northern Virginia, which includes Dulles International Airport, the FAA's Washington Center Flight Air Traffic Control Facility, and a number of regional airports. And I also want to thank you because last year I wrote to you in March, when I know you had a lot going on about some concerns I had been hearing from a number of my air traffic controllers about working conditions of, during COVID. And you guys pivoted very quickly. You brought in some new safety protocols and everything, which really helped. And I just want to thank you for, for your quick pivot and for, and for being responsive to the needs of your controllers. I was also pleased that you guys came up with uh, authorization for controllers to receive each of the approved COVID-19 vaccines earlier this year and came up with a way for them to be able to do that and still perform their duties. Um, I was wondering if you could update us on the status of vaccinations within the FAA workforce. Uh, well, thank you for the question. And yes, adapting uh, to to COVID was 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 quite a feat. Um, I will I will be the first to give credit uh, to our people, uh, our leadership, but also uh, our labor partners have been absolutely fantastic in working through us. Uh, our uh, aerospace medical uh, team has worked very closely with the. Sorry, CEO. Administrator, my time is limited. So if you would just answer the question that was posed, which is which is, can you update us on the on the status of vaccinations of the FAA workforce? Do you have do you have statistics about the percentage of, of employees who have been fully vaccinated yet? I don't I don't have that percentage, but uh, but I will get you as much detail as we possibly can. Uh, as with any other federal workforce, you know we don't have a mandatory uh, vaccination program, but we have. Uh, work to make sure that they had the highest possible priority in getting vaccinations. Very good, thank you. Now, we've heard, all heard that air travel is expected to surge this summer as there's this great big pent up demand and more and more people are getting vaccinated and the CDC is relaxing public health restrictions. Is FAA prepared to meet this increased demand and can you do so with, while still prioritizing safety for your workforce? Because it's my understanding that one of the one of the impacts of the early part of the pandemic was that you you had you missed a couple of classes for the new 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 recruits for air traffic controllers. So I was just wondering if you got those workforce uh, you know limitations resolved, and if if you're going to be able to meet the needs of the surge in the summer. So Congresswoman, the short answer to your question is yes, uh, but as you point out, uh, th there was an impact on our training pipeline because we had to focus on keeping the operation uh, running on a daily basis. And what that meant was we had to put a pause 
on anyone who was in an air traffic facility who wasn't required for that day's operation. And we do quite a bit of, of on-the-job training once our controllers come out of the academy. Uh, and, and we also had to uh, undergo a pause uh, in our training environment uh, to make sure that we were promoting social distancing and other health, public health protocols within the agency. The good news is that that pipeline has started back up again, but uh, as we continue to hire, we need to make sure that the controllers are getting out into the facilities and getting trained uh, as we go forward. But I'm confident that we have what we need uh, for this uh, the summer demand, uh, but it is definitely a focus area going on into uh, future years to make sure that we get back on top of, uh, of what our training requirements are. Thank you. Now, I was glad to see that the FAA's FY22 budget request includes an emphasis on air traffic modernization, which, which includes uh, some, some you know, investments in air traffic control towers. Now, I represent, as I mentioned, a number of regional airports, and among them the uh, Manassas Regional Airport, which is a reliever for Dulles and National and frequently hosts military law enforcement and medevac flights. The tower there is more than 60 years old. It can't physically uh, support the, the most up-to-date air traffic control technology. It's also got line of sight issues because when it was constructed, the tree line was very low. It has now grown up such that, that it's very difficult for the controllers to see what's coming. Um, but it, this is one of those lease towers. So I know that it's at the bottom of the list of, of those that are gonna get support from the FAA. Are there creative financing or other ways that we can we can address the issue of these these towers and the and the and the necessary um, fixes to them? Well, the, uh, as you state, uh, since our uh, controllers are working in the tower, even though it is leased, and the condition of the facility is of of uh, of great importance to us. And uh, if there are creative uh, financing alternatives. Uh, that will get the work done. You know, we would certainly be interested in understanding what those are and uh, and working together to make sure that the facility is remediated. Uh, but it is it it is uh, those priorities are things that we will constantly work through when we look at our facilities and equipment budget uh, going forward. Thank you, Administrator. Mr. Trone. I understand Mr. Trones had a bit of technical difficulty. We may have to come back to him. There we go. We're here. All right. Here you are. Go for it. Uh, that button didn't work too good. Hey, uh, Mr. Administrator, quickly. Uh, we know safety, efficiency are the top priorities of the FAA. Mr. Trone, we're going to come back to you. We need to start the second round of hearing, and we'll try to work out your difficulties in the meantime. Maybe you can go on a, uh, a telephone mode or something of, of that sort. Let me, as we go into the second round, let me ask members, please ask your questions within the five-minute time frame so as to give the administrator time to answer within that time frame. We, we really need to move along. I don't want to interrupt people in mid-sentence. On the other hand, uh, you need to give the time for the answer to be accommodated within the five minute time frame. I would ask members uh, uh, to, to do that. So let's begin the uh, second round and, and I will uh, I will begin. Uh, I did mention in the old opening statement that uh, <clears throat> the world was stunned by two Pratt & Whitney engine failures that occurred on the same day in February, one in Colorado, one in the Netherlands. There were some pretty dramatic uh, photographs that came out of those incidents. Uh, large parts of the airframe dropped from the sky onto residential property in both uh, situations. Now, the official cause of these Pratt & Whitney engine fires is, is currently under investigation by the uh, NTSB and the Dutch Safety Board. Uh, both, uh, at this point, appear to be unrelated to the cause of the MAX accidents. Uh, maybe you can confirm that, Mr. Administrator. Uh, they, what they do have in common, of course, is that they both come under FAA regulatory authority. Uh, the MAX accidents uh, raise questions about communication and coordination between the FAA's aircraft certification and flight standard services. 
The Pratt and Whitney accidents are raising questions about communication and coordination within these services. So after after the uh, after a 2018 Pratt and Whitney engine accident, the NTSB at that point recommended greater collaboration between engine and airframe manufacturers, which should have led to more collaboration between FAA engine and aircraft certification offices. So uh, I wonder what accident what what actions the uh, FAA has taken to implement those earlier NTSB recommendations. Uh, how will the FAA validate the effectiveness of these uh, actions? And then more, more generally, uh, are these genuine problems, these problems of coordination and collaboration? Um, what's the FAA leadership doing to encourage and support cross-disciplinary collaboration within the agency? Um, if you do see this as a, as a serious problem, does, the threat does seem to to, to uh, come. Uh, there, there does seem to be a thread connecting these incidents. I, I wonder if you'd have any comments more generally about uh, what corrections are called for. Well, thank, thank you, Chair Price. And you raise a, a very important issue. And uh, there actually has been uh, a lot of uh, collaboration and, and changes made. But that doesn't mean that, that we're done by any means, uh, as, you, as you said. We work very closely with the manufacturers to make continual uh, improvements in engine reliability so that events like this uh, do not occur. And engine failure, if you look at the, the various generations of uh, jet engines uh, over their life, we're really in the fifth generation of technology since uh, jet, jet engines were introduced decades ago. Uh, it is many orders of magnitude less that we see uh, problems like this, extremely low probability and very high reliability. That's one reason why uh, since really the mid 80s uh, or, or early 80s that we have been in a situation where many transoceanic aircraft operate successfully uh, across the ocean uh, with sufficient reliability on only two engines. Uh, but we're never satisfied. And as you state, you know, these recent events uh, are concerning, um, the, the, particularly the broken uh, fan blade events, these uh, blade out events that have damaged the cowling and created debris. The, um, we have done several things uh, to deal with that. Um, we have increased inspection frequency of the fan blades, uh, and we are working very closely with both the airframe manufacturer and the engine manufacturer to make sure that uh, the, uh, the structure around the engine, the cowling, and the inlet area uh, does not damage the, the aircraft structure, but that also we don't have these situations where debris is falling to the ground. So we'll continue to do that. Um, we are requiring the manufacturers to address strengthen the cowling. Uh, we also completed uh, over the last uh, period of time an engine safety call to action that went back and looked at the last five year period uh, all of these events have somewhat unique uh, characteristics, but uh, we continue to monitor them and uh, we are taking, a, again, a systems approach. Again, not looking at the engine and the airframe as separate things, but as how they work together. And our aircraft, we actually went through a reorganization where our aircraft certification uh, houses the, uh, uh, the engine cert and airframe cert within the same organization so they can have regular dialogue and have regular updates about the various uh, permutations and combinations of engines um, and airframes going forward. We will continue to build on that foundation as we go forward. Uh, thank you. Mr. diaz Blar. All right, Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Sure can. Good, good, thank you. Um, I want to go back to very, very briefly uh, speaking. Uh, we've had a lot of conversation about certification, but but uh, I want to talk a little bit about international engagement uh, uh, to create uniform aviation standards, uh, you know, and, and requirements among among uh, global aviation regulators. Uh, what is the FAA's plan to implement these directives to enhance FAA's global leadership position? I, don't, I know that we've kind of talked already about some of this, but wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, quickly expand on that. Thank you, Ranking Member 
Lord, uh, uh, this covers a number of, of areas. Uh, we have, uh, we work through ICAO uh, and the US and the FA in particular have, have played a leadership role for decades in aviation safety. So we work with ICAO, but also work with individual civil aviation authorities around the world <clears throat> to make sure that the uh, standards on things like pilot training, and uh, aircraft maintenance and operations that uh, the, the, the level of aviation safety is improved uh, around the world. So when it comes to things like uh, uh, upset recovery training for pilots, for example, uh, as we implement those programs and requirements for US carriers, we'll work through ICAO to make those scalable around the world, but we don't wait. We're also making sure that those best practices and those procedures are understood and can be implemented by other aviation authorities around the world. And we will continue to do that. Um, with respect to uh, aircraft certification, again, we work from that baseline with the, uh, with the CMT, the certification management team, the four state countries that I talked about. And, uh, and we actually have a safety summit to reinforce the importance of international collaboration and alignment on all aspects of aviation safety. We're planning for that uh, in June, and uh, we will continue to have that kind of dialogue and collaboration with uh, the international aviation safety community going forward. I appreciate that. Minister Dixon, you already kind of touched on, on what I'm gonna ask you about now, and it's dealing with, because uh, we keep hearing a lot about this advanced air mobility and you know the, the, the potential for moving people on cargo short distances through through the air with um, obviously, you know, few potentially noise impacts and uh, and even emissions. Now, I understand that Florida may, ha may, may be home to several of these innovating uh, companies out there. And so what can you tell us about the status of certification of these new unmanned aircraft? And when could we or should we expect them to be certified? And, um, you know, what's the timeline for the first one of these potential Lights. I mean, where where are we? Is this uh, is this real? Is this is this soon, or is this something that we're are we decades away from this? Well, thank you for the question. No, we are not decades away. This is real. Uh, in fact, uh, the FAA is working with uh, seven uh, companies right now on certification of advanced air mobility vehicles. And uh, but it's important to understand that it's not just the certification of the vehicle; it's also the uh, how the vehicle operates, the infrastructure from which it operates from, and uh, and what all the safety rules uh, are around those operations. So we have to make sure that we're taking, again, an enterprise approach across the agency. If I have a certified uh, vehicle, but I don't have my air traffic control protocols set up to be able to accommodate those types of operations, if I don't have the infrastructure to be able to accommodate it, then we're actually not going to, to make the kind of progress that we want. So certification is one thing. Uh, we do at this point anticipate that uh, there's a, a, a good possibility, I would say a high likelihood that we'll have the first uh, designs certified sometime in 2023. And that could mean if we are able to keep everyone aligned and in formation on those other areas, that I talked about that we could see the first AAM operations as early as 2024. And that certainly is the path that we want to be on. And, and we look forward to uh, working with you and the committee and all of our stakeholders and our, uh, our uh, authorizing committees uh, as we move forward on these exciting new opportunities. It is exciting and, you know, but there's a lot to do. And again, is, you know, I, I don't have a lot of time, but, you know, will the federal government have a role? Should it have a role for, construction of, of these ports, et cetera. Those are all issues that we're going to have to deal with, and I look forward to uh, to working with you on those. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Trone, it looks like you're back in business, so we'll recognize you next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. we got a new, new telephone. Uh, Mr. Dixon, uh, we know safety and efficiency is a top priority at FAA. Um, what criteria do you use to create your priority list for modernizing your ground-based infrastructure, and what do you see as the most pressing priorities? Well, thank you for the question. And our ground-based infrastructure uh, is extremely important to us 
you know, the we have the, you know, we're talking about aviation safety today, but the FAA is also an operator, like an airline or uh, a company from the private sector because we operate the air traffic control system. And so making sure that our own uh, infrastructure our fleet of towers and radar facilities and everything is is uh, is maintained and refurbished is extremely important. So uh, we look at several different criteria. Uh, we look at any operational issues that might be coming up. Uh, we measure the reliability and and uh, I get reports on a minute by minute basis if we have some kind of outage in the system somewhere. Um, you know of of whether it's an approach control system or radios or whatever. So all those things that require uh, maintenance or software upgrades, uh, we will look to correct those. We'll look at the uh, obsolescence uh, of our ground-based navigational age, the age of our, the physical age of our equipment. Uh, also, whether technology will continue to be supported, you know, as, as spectrum needs change and connectivity uh, and there are opportunities to to uh, to share information in a, in a different way uh, and in a more efficient way, we've got to make sure that we're not using outdated technology that's not able to leverage those capabilities. And then Let finally, shut, can I shut you off? the opportunity for reduced comment, maintenance uh, costs. Our time is limited. So I agree with all those assessments. And uh, when you talk about next-gen technology, uh, I'd also argue the instrument landing systems we have are in dire need of modernization. So when you talk about next gen, you know, what is the FFA doing to modernize these instrument landing systems in developing this next gen ILS systems? Well, it's a great question. Uh, there is not a particular, uh, any effort underway uh, to specifically modernize ILS. ILS is a very uh, robust and a very critical system. However, we are looking at uh, alternative systems that can be, uh, for example, GPS-based that will provide the same or similar capability. And uh, I know the subcommittee tasked us to look at uh, the potential benefits of, of transponder landing systems, a similar type of technologies, and, uh, and we'll have more information on that uh, for you and the committee uh, very soon on our efforts in that area. Great. That's exactly what we're after. That would be good. Uh, quickly, let's jump over to EAS, Essential Air Service. Uh, the Biden administration, Secretary Buttigieg, everybody wants to drive investment in rural America. And what is the FAA doing to help in rural communities uh, with the EAS system? Well, as you, as you said, uh, the Department of Transportation actually uh, oversees uh, the Essential Air Service Program, and that provides subsidies for air carriers to, to serve uh, smaller and rural communities. Um, also, in response to one of the other members' questions earlier, I talked about the importance of the Airport Improvement Program to address infrastructure issues. Uh, around the aviation system. That is something that we are directly involved in and that our airports offices work very closely with airport sponsors on, and we will continue to do that. Um, and I would just emphasize that uh, smaller and rural airports uh, continue to pay, play a very important role in our aviation system. It's very important to me and very important to us as an agency. And our regional airport, our regional airport offices will continue to work uh, you know, with the airport sponsors to make sure that their infrastructure is maintained and improved yeah. the way that it needs to be. Uh, thank, thank you for that. Um, if you could, uh, we'd love for you to take a look at the Hagerstown, Maryland airport. Uh, federal funding put a new terminal in, longer runways, invested. They met all the criteria, met them all, to stay operation with EAS. And then the last administration closed the airport in Hagerstown, Maryland, so we'd like to take a look at that if you have a chance. But thank you, and I yield back. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Henson. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, um, Administrator, for uh, sticking this out. Um, I'd like to go back to um, kind of a line of questioning we've heard about um, from several of my colleagues now. Um, uh, Representative Rutherford talked about drones for delivery. Um, obviously, unmanned 
aircraft systems are a valuable tool. Um, they can be life-saving as well. Um, two particular uses that I'd like to talk about. Um, ag, it's hugely important to the ag industry. Um, GPS systems, we can increase crop yields, um, decrease farm inputs, uh, maximize efficiency. Um, the list is long about what drones can do to help um, with farming through precision agriculture. But another critical use, and this is the one I really wanna focus on, um, is disaster response. Um, we had a major storm um, come through my district um, in August of 2020, August 10th, uh, sticks out in my mind, um, a, a derecho that came through. Um, we had a lot of trees down, we had communications down, um, mobile towers completely destroyed, just deadly weather conditions. And um, drones would have really helped our first responders not only find and rescue Iowans, but also um, in the aftermath of the storm, as we were trying to get our um, applications in for disaster assistance and with FEMA, you know, we, we relied a lot on the Civil Air Patrol, but these could have um, moved that process along um, faster. Um, obviously, when we're talking about beyond the line of visual sight, this is a place where I think we, we clearly need to make some, some inroads there um, because this, this would enable some safety. Um, again, that damage assessment to move quickly. Um, humans cannot get in there as quickly as, as these drones can. So um, what is the FAA doing uh, to move the process of um, beyond visual line of sight forward for unmanned um, drones and aircraft systems at this point? Well, thank you for the question. I would, I would, uh, I'm going to answer it in two different ways uh, because we are, we are on a journey to uh, have scalable, regular, beyond visual line of sight operations. That's what we all want. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got to be done in the context of a safe aviation system. So in that context, very important rulemaking that we just completed on remote identification and on within visual line of sight operations over people. And I mentioned the BEYOND program. Uh, the BEYOND program will allow us to work with uh, various applications. You mentioned a few of them. Uh, for uh, to, to in order to inform uh, the uh, the processes for not only aviation safety but security and and other uh, policy decisions so that we can get to uh, scalable regular routine beyond visual line of sight operations so that is that is the path that, that we are on and remote ID was a significant milestone uh, in that goal with respect to uh, specific applications, we already have a special governmental interest uh, exception and process by which we can authorize uh, specific uh, types of operations to support disaster recovery. And, uh, and in the future, we will be able to respond in near real time uh, to those kinds of events. But there is a process specifically designed to address those needs because we recognize uh, that they're out there and there are things that UAS can do that uh, you know a pilot in an airplane would not be able to get uh, as close to or it may be unsafe for them to be able to actually uh, get to the, the scene of, of where the need is. Yeah and you mentioned that you're able to maybe uh, get that reaction in real time. Um, how long is that time frame I mean truly for, for getting that exception because um, I think my biggest question to you would be like um, going forward um, do we need to be waiving restrictions? How how do we need to work together to make that process as quick as possible? Um, because I think, you know, as we're looking at expanding this technology, it's moving very quickly. Um, its application is moving very quickly. So um, what does that time frame look like right now? And do we need to uh, do anything else to, to speed that up? Well, a, a waiver takes, takes some time, but that would be more for routine operations. The SGI process can take place very quickly. Uh, I'm not, I don't know exactly uh, I'd have to get back to you on the specifics, but the process does exist and it, and it can be executed in, in near real time. So uh, I'll, I will follow up with you uh, directly um, uh, after the hearing on exactly what the nuts and bolts are of, uh, of requesting uh, that particular uh, exemption. All right, thank you, Mr. Much, uh, Administrator Dixon and uh, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Ms. Watson Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Secretary, could you give me some specific um, understanding of what your zero tolerance approach involves and how you're actually, um, I guess, tr training and um, individuals 
crew members, et cetera, uh, in dealing with unruly, unsafe, and um, disruptive passengers while in flight? Yes, thank you for the opportunity to explain uh, in more detail. The uh, special emphasis uh, enforcement program that we initiated in early January uh, essentially moves us past a paradigm where in previous times, depending on the facts of, of a situation, we might have uh, engaged in counseling or uh, 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 some other sort of corrective action rather than moving directly to a civil penalty. So we're bypassing all that, we're moving directly to civil penalty. And what we, uh, what we do is we get, a, we get reports, sometimes uh, through multiple channels, sometimes through my air traffic organization, also through the, uh, the crew on the airplane, will report either to air, uh, to air traffic control and usually also to the airline ops center. So we will, we will gather all of that data and then uh, our inspectors and chief counsel's office will then take over the investigation from there. We have to gather all of the facts around the investigation to make sure that it will stand up uh, legally. And, and then we will take the appropriate enforcement mm -hmm. action, uh, which, which will include financial penalties, again, of up to $35,000 as we go forward. But it's really important that we gather all the facts and talk to everyone okay. who was a witness uh, to the I, event. I can appreciate that, but I'm, I'm also concerned about what happens in real time. When one of the, you know, one of the pro professionals on uh, crew members encounters a uh, passenger that is being disruptive, uh, verbally abusive, intimidating, is a uh, even just with another passenger, what are you actually able to do? What are they actually trained to do then? Well, the, the crews are trained. Uh, first of all, it's very important that the uh, flight deck crew, the pilots and the, uh, uh, and the flight attendants are, uh, have full visibility and they're communicating into uh, what the needs are. So if the airplane is on the ground, uh, and we have a situation like this, many times the captain will taxi the airplane back to the gate and remove the passenger. They may divert the flight or they may turn uh, to a different airport uh, to get the airplane on the ground. Uh, or if the behavior uh, changes and the situation moderates, uh, they will go, uh, they may be able to go on to their destination. So it's really fact dependent. I would also say that we're in very close communication uh, if, if we have a situation that escalates on many of the flights, uh, the federal air marshals are on board, and I'm, we're in very close collaboration with TSA on these on these events. And uh, in an appropriate situation, uh, you can have an air marshal uh, intervene as well. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, thank you, Ms. Torres. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. Administrator, as we um, talk about aviation safety, a key funding mechanism for airport safety improvements, um, airport improvement program grants uh, have been vital to safety, especially during the COVID um, pandemic. I was particularly delighted to see FAA put out a notice of funding opportunity for an environmental mitigation pilot program on Monday, uh, a pilot program that I put into the 2018 FAA reauthorization to boost innovation in AIP grants. So thank you so much um, for your work on that. Um, I wanna raise one example of a safety issue that could be solved by, by this program in my district. And that is at the Ontario International Airport. Um, they have land in the middle of the airport. Buildings originally transferred from FAA, uh, from to, to FAA from DOD as is condition. Uh, these World War II era buildings have become a place where at one point homeless people needed to be removed for their safety um, and reduce the risk of them entering the airfield. Ontario personnel needed to find ways to clear out wildlife so they did not um, 
impact the airfield. These old buildings are in such disrepair that they are not safe uh, to enter due to structural or asbestos um, hazards. Can you share um, any more details from the president's American Jobs Plan about the increased funding proposed there um, for the AIP program? And secondly, what do you see as uh, the role of AIP in funding airport safety improvements like the one at Ontario International Airport? Well, thank you for the question. And, uh... You know, as you know, uh, the American Jobs Plan includes uh, $10 billion uh, investment in AIP to augment uh, the existing uh, airport grant program. So I don't have anything uh, specifically beyond that, but that is something that we'll be working very closely with. And, and we look forward to working with you. And I look more forward to uh, learning about what the needs um, at Ontario specifically are. Um, you know, it's an, as you said, it's a, an effective investment tool to fund safety uh, and security projects. Um, project eligibility for AIP is, of course, defined by statute. So we, I need to learn, you know, we would need to learn more. Uh, and certainly my airports team is, is anxious to, to get the details about what the needs are on Ontario so that we can work uh, with your office on that. Thank you, and I understand that the Ontario leadership has uh, attempted to work um, with the regional FAA office. So um, I look forward to continuing um, this process um, with you um, as I continue to fly in and out of, uh, of this um, airport. Thank you again for joining us today. Um, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Ms. Wexton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Administrator. I'd like to follow up on a little bit of other issues about tower control. Um, and in particular, it's about the remote tower pilot program. I understand that you had the opportunity to visit the Leesburg remote tower program in my district. And could you please share with us some of the takeaways about the benefits and, and the future of air traffic control as it may, as it may involve some remote towers and remote uh, capabilities? No, thank you for the question. Uh, I really am glad that I went out to see the operation uh, at Leesburg. And uh, it's an exciting opportunity, but it is a very tall order. Um, these these uh, systems were brought in kind of off the shelf commercial systems. So they, they, are not, uh, they are not to the level of redundancy and reliability of systems that were specifically uh, developed for the national airspace system. But having said, so there has been a developmental journey, uh, if you will, uh, with the vendor. And a lot of this depends on the vendor's ability to be able to uh, provide the appropriate level of documentation to, to justify how robust the system is. But having said that, um, when I visited Leesburg, I was able to climb all over the camera tower and um, uh, and also uh, talk with the controllers who and, and see how the how the visual system and the communication systems are, are integrated and uh, it is it is very impressive um, I will say that Leesburg is a very challenging operational environment as you know it's uh, adjacent to or very close to Dulles and of course uh, part of the national capital region which has very unique airspace uh, in the world and, uh, and it's a VFR tower. So you can essentially have, uh, you know, we don't, it's not like airplanes are coming in, you know, under radar control, they can pretty much come into the traffic pattern from any direction. So for a controller, the system has to have a very high level of, of capability to be, for the controllers to have the kind of awareness uh, that they need of, of airplanes in the pattern. But uh, so they're completing the operational validation now and uh, I expect that within that process will be completed within the next month or so. And then uh, we will uh, complete our uh, reporting on what uh, remote tower environment we'll look at with this type of application. And, and then our uh, tech ops uh, engineering group will essentially look at all the documentation and the reliability of the system. And I expect for that to happen uh, probably first quarter of next year is what that looks like. So 
you know, again, this is looking like something, if everything goes according to plan, that we should be able to operationalize, uh, you know, hopefully with a favorable outcome. Uh, but I've just got to say that as we've been talking about with aircraft certification, you know, we're not going to certify the system unless until we believe that it's bulletproof and it's safe. And assuming that we can get there, uh, I think we'll be able to move on to the next step here in a relatively uh, relatively short period of time. I'm optimistic. That's very encouraging. As you know, this this uh, this pilot program has been going since 2014, and they're they're raring to go and to get it operationalized. So thank you so much. And with that, I'll yield back. Uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Administrator, we've reached the uh, the third round here. I believe it, um, if our requests are accurate, I believe it will involve only the ranking member and myself. So we'll we'll proceed quickly. But uh, we do have a couple of further questions with your indulgence, and we we, we appreciate your uh, hanging in uh, with us. Um, Absolutely. I uh, th my my question is, I think, in the realm of uh, of elaborating on on some earlier responses, but I, I do think it's an important elaboration. I want to ask you to make it. Uh, as you well know, the DOT Office of Inspector General, NTSB, numerous other uh, reviewers have identified weakness in your process for certifying certain planes in the uh, MAX fleet. In 2019, the Safety Oversight and Certification Advisory Committee was established to make, to make further recommendations, and the uh, Aircraft Certification Safety and Accountability Act, enacted in December, has mandated more changes. Uh, you've referred to all of this today, uh, including the progress you've made toward uh, uh, following up on this and, and improving the certification process. My, my question takes note of the fact, though, that um, the full benefit of all these changes is, um, is still some years off. Uh, and in the meantime, you've got to continue to certify planes. So um, I want you to address that. For, for planes that are currently undergoing certification, how, uh, what, what has changed? And how is the FAA tracking and reconciling the differences between today's certification process and the future certification? Uh, how's that, how does that work to ensure that safety uh, is, is not compromised in this interim period? And uh, related question, will the FAA retroactively apply certification reforms uh, as they're implemented? Um, if you could address that, I, I think it would help us understand how this is going to work. Well, thank you, Chairman. Uh, um, first of all, uh, I think I want to emphasize that we embrace uh, cert reform uh, broadly and the cert reform uh, legislation in particular. Uh, having said that, as you noted, there have been other reviews that have provided uh, beneficial recommendations for process improvement, and we want to make sure that those are accounted for uh, as well. So all of these reviews, uh, in, in my view, are very beneficial. We're all about uh, process improvement, and, and I would never say that uh, you ever get to a point where uh, you are as safe as, as you want to be. You've always got to be improving. You've always got to look at safety as, as a journey. Uh, there's all, there are always going to be risks that have to be the focus of, of mitigations that have to be put in place. That's just the nature of, of aviation. I think, as you said in your opening comments, uh, you know, the low-hanging fruit is gone. And the expectations that I have and the public has uh, for aviation safety are, are extremely important. We intend uh, to meet that bar. So what's changed in the short term? Again, I'll, I'll just uh, reiterate a few things and, and happy to elaborate on them. Uh, the institutionalizing of the technical advisory board. We are going to do that going forward on every major certification project uh, that we have. And we will con that will provide us with kind of an internal validation, if you will, of the certification process. Uh, the importance of the voluntary safety reporting program, I don't think can be underestimated. It speaks to the open communication and culture, uh, safety culture and safety focus that we need within the agency. Uh, I have seen this work uh, in the air carrier world and it is, uh, it is a program uh, that I championed 
and uh, that our leadership and our and our our union partners uh, have embraced, and uh, and that will help us identify issues in a much more uh, proactive and fluid manner than we've been able to in the past. Uh, these integrated project teams, again, that's a new construct that's put in place to make sure that we are breaking down stovepipes and silos. And that's one of the biggest challenges on an agency like the FAA is that you've got very capable subject matter experts who are very good at their jobs, but they kind of look at their job within their area of responsibility, their checklist, if you will. And we need to make sure that we're taking an enterprise approach. And then I talked earlier about data. There's been a lot of progress made there. Um, longer term, we have divided the, uh, the CERT reform activities, uh, again, centering around the CERT reform bill into 10 work streams. And so that involves SMS rulemaking. It involves uh, the uh, workforce forecasting, the emphasis on making sure that we are uh, conducting systematic uh, system safety assessments, that we are evolving our, our data structure and our decision-making processes around aviation safety, that we make sure that those systems continue to keep up and keep us abreast and out in front of uh, emerging risks. And, and so that, that really is those, uh, uh, my aviation safety leadership is meeting weekly to monitor progress. Uh, we have a project team that reports to me on a regular basis as to how we are working through uh, all of the issues. And, uh, and we have spent some time uh, with your staff, but we are happy at any point in time to, to give you a progress report on, on how we're doing. Thank you, sir. Mr. diaz -Blar. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, one of the really exciting things that I keep hearing about is the potential return of supersonic aircraft to commercial aviation, and which I would hope is, is, is something also coming. And I would also hope that the U.S. will be leading the world in, in returning to commercial supersonic flights with uh, including with passengers. And so can you describe the FAA's actions to date as, as you uh, prepare to certify these new aircraft? Again, as I asked you before, is this something that's uh, coming, you think, relatively soon? Because I would hope that the FAA continues to play a leadership role in developing international standards uh, for this as well, for supersonic, uh, supersonic aircraft. Yes, sir. Well, as you know, uh, in the 2018 reauthorization, uh, we were uh, tasked to take a leadership role uh, in supersonic, and we have done that globally uh, through uh, engagement at ICAO. But we have also been working with uh, several manufacturers uh, here within the U.S. on what their projects look like. Uh, most recently, the activity we have undertaken was to uh, update our uh, rule around uh, uh, supersonic uh, flight testing approvals uh, to make sure that when these platforms are in a position where they can actually be uh, undergo testing, that there is a, uh, a proper protocol to be able to do that. And that really is uh, a concrete first step in moving uh, supersonic capability forward. And, and so you think, again, this is not also pie in the sky, this is something that is near term, relatively near term? Well, I, I, you know, obviously there are there are decisions that will have to be made. Uh, uh, we talked about noise earlier. Uh, yeah. You know, there are other other decisions that have to be made. Assuming that we can resolve all of those issues, we are moving forward on the uh, what the design and certification of these machines might look like, and uh, and we have to work not only within the U.S. but internationally to make sure that the uh, protocols are consistent for where they can where they can operate. So. We will, we will definitely stay close on that. There's a lot of work to be done, no doubt. I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, if I have a, a couple more minute, minutes, if I may. Uh, Administrator, I appreciate the work that you've done to date on the South Florida Metroplex redesign. And uh, my understanding of that is that in April, April, uh, you implemented the first phase of this project. And so obviously we all share that your objective, the objective of moving flights more safely and efficiently and I look forward to seeing the benefits from the uh, this new procedure in Florida. Of course, any uh, airspace airspace changes obviously brings uh, issues, right? Issues with, for example, noise levels. And so that's something that we've talked about, I guess, in this hearing that we took. We obviously always have to bring it up in every hearing. 
Can you describe uh, your community engagement activities uh, with South Florida residents so to make sure that their voices are heard on community, you know, on impacts of noise? Yes, and, and uh, I think the, the South Florida Metroplex is, uh, is a good model for, you know, how we have worked over the years to improve uh, and embrace uh, community engagement uh, more broadly. And as I mentioned earlier, you know, we will continue to undertake these efforts. So just as a few examples, um, back in April of uh, 2019, we held eight public workshops, five of which were in the Miami area. Um, and then another uh, round of 12 uh, workshops in uh, within 2020. And uh, three of them in Miami had more than 27,000 views online. And one of the things that we've learned during COVID is that virtual technologies are a great tool in our toolbox to be able to uh, in, uh, engage an even broader spectrum of the community than you typically can uh, with in-person engagement. It's not always a substitute, but it definitely uh, helps us make sure that we generate the desired level of interest and engagement. Um, a couple of things, uh, we also notified more than 800 federal and state uh, and local officials uh, of that outreach. Uh, we reviewed over 3,200 public comments um, before the final uh, EA was released in October of last year. And as you mentioned, uh, we implemented the first procedures in April. Um, ultimately, we'll have 131 newer modified procedures that will connect Florida airports, uh, including uh, four international airports, more seamlessly with the rest of the uh, U.S. aviation system. And we've made some changes uh, to flight paths to accommodate community concerns. For example, one of the departures, we actually routed over a water treatment plant and then we also recentered some uh, some flight paths over Biscayne Bay to keep them more away from uh, from populated areas. And this is just an example of the kind of early engagement that's very beneficial as we go through these aerospace projects. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Administrator. My time is up. If I if I can uh, get the indulgence of the chairman for another few seconds, you know, you you were talking about these things, and what reminds me, what hit me was the importance of leadership. Uh, your leadership has been, frankly, instrumental, and so I'm grateful for that. I mentioned that my my opening statement, my gratitude to your continual service to the country, and uh, and your leadership is, uh, is has been important. It's noted, and I am grateful for it. So thank you, uh, Administrator, and with that, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for allowing me to go over for a few seconds of my uh, time. I appreciate it. I yield back. Uh, certainly, no problem. Uh, we are concluded, I think, for today's hearing. Uh, Administrator, we appreciate your participation, and uh, we look forward to working with you as we uh, move forward to uh, receive the full budget from the administration and to uh, craft the fiscal 2022 appropriations bill, and uh, we hope also the America Jobs Plan. Uh, the committee staff will be in touch with your uh, budget office regarding questions for the record. I, I know that I have some questions to submit. Other members do as well. We would uh, appreciate your working with uh, OMB to return that information to the to the subcommittee within 30 days from this coming Friday. Uh, if you do that, we'll be able to publish the transcript of today's hearing and uh, make informed decisions for fiscal uh, 22. Uh, Jeff Blar, you have any parting comments? No, Mr. Chairman, again, uh, as always, you uh, you always lead a good meeting and uh, appreciate uh, this very important hearing. And to the Administrator, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, the uh, hearing is adjourned.